Yo, what's happening, everybody? It's Jeff and Anwar. We're back on the Orange Bloods Texas Football Channel. This episode brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the best in fantasy, whether you're talking about season-long fantasy, one-day fantasy, they will match up to 100% of your first deposit up to $100. They basically want to give you $100 to check out their platform and do a little gambling with them. Check them out, Underdog Fantasy. Uh, as far as Onward and I are concerned, like and subscribe to the video, especially if you're new to the channel. Like, give us a chance. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, I promise we will entertain you on a daily basis. We talk lots of Texas football. We're going to be talking Texas wide receivers. And Steve Sarkeesian specifically uh, telling us what kind of team he's going to have, I think, in 2022. But we do want you to subscribe to the channel, get notifications, Tell your friends, leave comments in the comments section, print up t-shirts, like whatever it is that you want to do, do it to celebrate the channel we love you for. Onwar, Texas, we did a breaking news video yesterday of Texas adding a, another wide receiver through the portal. As a matter of fact, it was like wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Tariq Milton's decision on Orange Blood yesterday. As soon as, soon as he landed, Jason Sukumel was able to get an interview with him. Uh Alex has got some thoughts on him. We had our video out, obviously. Still kind of a surprise that of all of the needs, even though Sark has told us they would be adding wide receivers, there was a surprise element to Milton's decision yesterday. And I think, weirdly, a kind of a definitive statement of intent from Steve Sarkeesian about what it is he's looking for with this team going into this season. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting when we start talking we were talking offseason needs, you know, after, you know, December, you know, you if you and I would have said what's the biggest need, I don't think we would have said receiver. I think we would we would lean towards offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, like I don't think we would have lead, said that's the area that needs to get better. But that's the area that Steve Sarkeesian has been focused on and really laser focused on this entire offseason catch. And, you know, I think we didn't have any issue with, the, you know, getting Isaiah Nayor and thought that was, you know, a good pickup. And then the Jai Hall comes around in the end. And, of course, now a Tariq Milton is here. Three receivers catch. Like three three receivers, and by the way, that's not even including Jaleel Billingsley, who if we threw him in there, you know that you know that's that's still a fourth kind of skill position kind of guy. Where it's interesting that of all the needs that we would have thought were important, you know, if you said three offensive linemen, three defensive linemen, three linebackers, I think we'd say cool. I, you, you look at Tariq Milton and you go, oh, okay, so that's some some depth stuff. Probably doesn't address all your bigger needs, but I think it goes back to what you've been saying. It seems like Sarkeesian is telling us, I'm just focused on us scoring a lot of points, and we're just going to try to outscore everybody that we play. I mean, you got to do that anyway, but I think he's just looking for big plays for sure. Yeah, I think there's two sides of this. I think there's a conversation that we're about to have. I think we'll, we'll talk about both of these things, which is, this offense has to be good. This is doubling down on making sure that if anything happens this year at the wide receiver position and with regards to injuries or anything else, that they don't decline because this is going to be, be a team that is like an OU team of the last half decade or so under Lincoln Riley where it almost doesn't matter what they do on defense because if you're dropping 50 – you should win most of those games. And I think Texas has an offense that on paper you think are going to be among the leaders in the nation in scoring. I think they're probably going to average north of 40 points per game. So Sark is telling us, I don't necessarily know, even know what my defense is going to be, but like offensively, we're going to be really good come hell or high water, right? The other thing, though, and I kind of want to start with this because I hadn't thought about it until right before we started recording. If... Texas had the receiver room this year or last year in 2021 that it's going to have in 2022. What happens to last year's team? Because you can point to the Casey Thompson injury as one of the defining moments that started the decline of the team, but it also coincided with the Jordan Whittington injury. 
And when Whittington wasn't on the field, the Texas offense turned into an Xavier worthy one man show. And from week to week, you kind of cross your fingers and hope that, you know, Marcus Washington would show up and have a day. And back in the day when Joshua Moore was still a thing in the program, it was like, is this going to be the every other week where he shows up and does something? And I wonder if you take this group of receivers with Isaiah Nayor and Ajay Hall and Brennan Thompson coming in and all the pieces that they've, they've added, does what, what changes about last year's record? Because part of me thinks that's a bowl, that's a bowl team that – Five and seven doesn't happen if they're deeper at wide receiver. Am I making too much out of it, or are you willing to make that leap with me? So what's interesting, Catch, um, you know, as you start thinking about it, so I'm going back, and as you guys, as you're talking, I'm looking up some of the some of the stats. You know, it probably won't surprise you, Catch, that if I told you last year Texas was ranked second in rushing offense in the conference – Sounds just about right with, you know, the guys that they've had. What's interesting, though, Catch, they were actually ranked seventh in passing offense last year. And then I, as I looked up the stats a little bit deeper as we're, we're talking, uh, from long scrimmage plays, which was a very a very interesting stat, Texas was ranked ninth in, that, in the conference in long scrimmage plays. And so, you know, the only team that they were better than was Kansas, um, you know, and so, you know, we, we started to have all jokes aside. We're not going to go there. So, <laughs> I had the same thought in my head. Yeah, like, like, oh, all jokes. That. It's almost hard to say Kansas without yeah. like some sort of self-deprecating comment coming out afterwards. Yeah, it's, it's hard. So, so, you know, and, and the one thing we know, and I'm one of the things I kind of, you know, we highlighted, uh, in my Sunday pulpit, um, you know, the past from the past weekend was, Hey, this Starkeesian, how he wants big, you know, short plays. He's looking for those six, seven play drives. He doesn't like the long, uh, you know, 12 play, 15 play type of thing. That's not what he is, thinks about. Doesn't always think that's sustainable. So, catch when I start looking at it, even though, as again, Texas was second in points average last year. Uh, underneath Oklahoma, Oklahoma averaged 39.1. Texas is actually second with 35.3. But I think what you're talking about is pretty accurate. Looks like he, with the additions, they want to they make, he wants to make that jump from 35.3 up to that 40 or above uh, mark. And, he look, and it looks like it, the, the need and desire for uh, explosive plays catch. Uh, like if I go here, just to give you an example, if we're talking about, Explosive plays. So, like, let's say I'm, I'll start with 40 yards or more. Okay, Texas was ranked seventh in the Big 12. If I go 50 yards or or more catch, Texas was ranked fifth uh, in the Big 12 last year. Uh, when you go to the 60 plus mark, they were tied for first. A couple of teams that had um, were tied with six, uh, and then when you go 70 plus. Uh, they were tied for fifth in the conference. So I think that's what he looks at and goes, we got to be more explosive. Yeah, I just, you know, it, it's it's funny because we, when Whittington is healthy and then you add Isaiah Nayor, like that trio suddenly looks really scary on paper because we're going to do this thing with Jordan Whittington where there are two sides. He's like Two-Face and Batman. There's the injured Jordan Whittington, which Texas has seen way too often. And then there's the healthy Jordan Whittington, who I think can be an all big 12 receiver. If, you know, in a world where he's healthy for 12 games, I think you can put him in almost any offense in the big 12 and he'd be a one a or one B receiver for that school and produce numbers. It's really just a matter of him staying healthy. The Nayor Washington flip, is a win for Texas, and, and it didn't, hasn't taken very long, even in just the few glimpses in the spring game, to see that, oh, Isaiah Nayor is good. Okay, yeah. Get, check. Got it, right? It's what happens beyond those three that Texas is a bit vulnerable. And because even a Jai Hall, for all of that talent, is an unproven player with four catches to his resume the entire season. You know, it's funny in our Slack channel on Orange Bloods, and I think Alex has even kind of written a column today on the website 
uh, for those that aren't on Orange Bloods, shame on you. Get on Orange Bloods. Uh, you need to be reading Anwar and myself, but Alex Dunlap as well. He comes up with really interesting football themed content pieces. And he didn't quite understand the addition of Milton through the portal. Like, why this guy? Why now? There are bigger needs. There's no question about that. But Texas went through a period last year where they got a little light in the britches at the wide receiver position. And it just, and, and I think it coincided with the slide in the team. The team literally started losing games when Whittington started missing games and Thompson got hurt. So they can't have a wounded wide receiver passing game this year. And I, I do understand, I think, the addition of Milton because it is a double and triple down on this idea of what happened a year ago with our offense when one guy's lack of being able to stay healthy really changed who we were. I think he knows we're going to have to win a lot of games this year by scoring a lot of points. We can't be in a situation where if there's an injury to Xavier Worthy, we just got to shut things down at that point and we're no longer any good. You know, I think he's double and tripling down behind that. And I kind of completely understand that. I mean, sometimes the best way to strengthen yourself is to strengthen your biggest strength. Just go with it. Mm -hmm. And I think in a weird way, I don't anticipate that this most recent addition is going to have a monster season for Texas. But I think he'll be an upgrade over – like I think I would rather have him than Marcus Washington – because of the speed component. And in a world where he's forced to start six games a season, I think it's a slight upgrade over Marcus Washington. And, you know, considering Marcus Washington just left, leaving a bit of an experience void at wide receiver, not a bad pickup in my mind. Yeah, and catch, I think when you start thinking about the franchise who is Quinn Ewers, right? the best thing you can do for him outside of giving him a solid offensive line is just give him guys that can go, that can fly, that he can put that ball out there. So even if there's some times and some pockets where the t the offense may struggle catch, if he's got a guy that's just 10 yards open and he just bombs away, then all of a sudden it makes things right in the world, right? It just because now you're just adding on points after points after points. It makes it so Quinn doesn't have to be perfect. He doesn't have to be, you know, he's got to take care of the ball, more importantly. But once he gets past the taking care of the ball, you're like, all right, let Xavier Worthy fly down the field. Like, let let uh, Nayer do what he he's going to do. Let, let's let see what a Jai Hall can do. Let's see, you have Jordan Whittington have the ability to get open. Brandon Thompson, you know, what, what can you do? Tariq Milton, what can you do? Um, it just gives them tons of different options with in addition to having a Bijan and Roshan and Keelan and going down that list. So, you know, if anything, giving that guy more tools to operate with so he doesn't have to be perfect. He's just got to, he's just got to bomb away, catch just, you know, manage a game and have a, have four, four deep bombs a game, five deep bombs a game, you know, have guys be able to break free or, you know, on, on, shuttle passes, jet sweep, whatever the case may be, maybe it makes it their, his life a lot easier as well. Yeah, I there are a lot of little check marks that I think the addition of another receiver created. You know, we spent so much time talking about Jordan Addison. His talent level was so high that it was mostly like a conversation of if you can get an elite player, get an elite player no matter where he's at on the field. I mean, improve your football team by any means necessary if you're able to add, add elite talent. I don't know that we were having a lot of conversations, though, about wide receiver being a need position by comparison to some other positions, linebacker, edge rusher, even in the defensive backfield. I can't help but notice that, the in general, Sark is gone – one one time after another in the portal of improving the offense so far this offseason, they added Ryan Watts very early, and he's been an immediate upgrade for the Longhorns at the cornerback position, so a key addition. But up until now, and look, this could change. Literally, Texas might get a commitment today from uh, DeMonte Tucker-Dorsey, 
the Avante Tucker Dorsey, who's visiting on an official visit right now, the linebacker out of James Madison. They haven't upgraded, though, on defense in the portal. And furthermore, I don't think we saw a freshman in the spring that clearly looked like an impact player in the making for 2022. I think I had hopes that Justice Finkley would come in in the spring and tear it up and be running with the ones. And you'd go, oh, well, maybe you don't need a guy in the portal so much because that guy's ready to play right away. I mean, maybe he gets there, but it does. It, you can't say that as of yet. I, I, I just, I'm a little bit dismayed that they haven't done more defensively in the portal. And I know they've tried, but the bottom line is the bottom line. And all of their additions, save one so far, has come on the offensive side of the ball. I don't know what that tells me. It makes me think a lot of things. I just don't know. You know, it makes me think he doesn't believe in his defensive coaches, but I don't know if that's true. It makes me think they've got to score 50 points a game. I don't know if he thinks I, – I, I think a lot of things. I don't know that I know what the true answer is. What things do you think it tells you? Well, I mean, what it kind of has told me so far, Catch, is that <laughs> – they're guys that are out there that aren't necessarily sold on this defense. They're sold on the offense. Like you, they, 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 they were lining up on offense, right? I mean, that's you, you get Jordan Addison, you know, is was is at your at your front door. The the Bolitnikov winner. You've got no problem bringing in offensive players and having people believe in in the offense. And I think the issue is what we're seeing is how many people really believe in this defense and what this defense can do. Um, you know, and, and so that's a little bit of a reflection of, you know, last season, what the coaching staff has to do, maybe not enough familiarity with guys with Pete uh, K and what maybe what he was able to do out there in Washington, because it's such a remote location, beautiful city, by the way, but you, you get what I'm saying. So uh, I, I think that's what it tells me is that Texas, you know, there's always been that thing catch that, you know, players and who want to Texas wants to recruit some, they want to see certain things. <clears throat> I think Steve Starkeesian's resume for offense speaks for itself, but people have seen enough. They have enough great Alabama memory. They don't have enough good Texas defense memory. And then you start going through, you know, draft totals and what hasn't happened here. I think it's very easy for guys to say, mm, not quite sure about that thing. That's where they, you know, that's one thing that, for that to improve, the, the, the product on the field is going to have to get better. Yeah, Sark is going to be asked at some point, why didn't you if, – if, if he was facing the media today, I think one of the questions that might get asked is, why haven't you done more in the portal on the defensive side of the ball? And, again, we can talk about they've offered guys, they've brought guys in for visits, they've tried, they haven't landed – I, I, you know, I wonder. The answer can't be we didn't. We just didn't feel like we needed as many defensive players as I felt like we. That doesn't pass the smell test. So, how does he answer that question in your mind? If I put you in Sark's shoes and said, "Hey, coach, you guys have landed like six or seven guys in the portal, but only one." on the defensive side of the ball thus far, and you guys were pretty horrible on defense a year ago, what up? <coughs> what's, what's the answer to that beyond we just did, weren't able to close the deal in recruiting? Because that's a that's a horrible – I mean, you're, you're admitting there's a confession there that if you don't have to, you'd rather not say it like that. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't. It's a very good question to the point. I don't know how he would answer it when, when phrased like that, catch because I don't know how he could, um, you know, like I said, outside of just falling on a sword, uh, you know, I don't know how he, you know, does that. And you know, the, clearly there's been misses that cannot be ignored um, as relates to it. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know how he answers that. It's a, it's a it's a fascinating question that I, I really wish I had an answer to. It might not even be a question by the time we get to August if. They add three more three more guys on defense, which might not be impossible based on comments that he made um, a w even a week ago. But as it stands right now, they only have one guy. And it is the side of the ball that when the season ended a year ago, I think most people would have said, God, we need help on the offensive line. 
But that defense, oh, my God, we need players everywhere. And it's not a unit. That side of the ball hasn't improved with personnel, new personnel, the way we've talked about the Texas offense, where almost at every level you expect there to be new game changers from a year ago, really outside of running back. Look, it's an interesting topic. I think I definitely want to see what y'all's thoughts are on this. How many points per game is Texas going to score? <laughs> Does on, on a scale of one to 10, if this guy's forced to start six games this season, how good of an addition does that become all of a sudden? I, if you're telling me that this guy has to start six games because of injury, it feels like a seven or an eight, whereas upon first blush, it feels like a two or a three. It's, it's, a, re, it's a really hard question to answer, which is why I'm curious to see the comments in the comments section. Do us a solid. If, you, if you've never done it before, subscribe to the channel. Like this video if we've said something uh, that mildly entertains you or informs you. Uh, but for now, for Anwar Richardson and myself and Underdog Fantasy, we'll bid you farewell until next time. Later. <laughs>